common agreement in the medical world that Lyme disease exists. In fact, the CDC now estimates there may be as many as 300,000 new Lyme infections a year in the U.S. In school, it's horrible because I will sit through class and just zone out, and then after class, I don't even know what just happened. Campaigners have called it one of the most dangerous illnesses to threaten mankind today, but it's thought thousands of people are living with a disease which goes undiagnosed. The number of cases has been increasing. Most are concentrated in the Northeast, 96% of them in 13 states. So what is Lyme disease and where does it come from? And how does it cause so much damage to so many people and can low-dose naltrexone help to combat this epidemic? I started my journey by travelling to Poughkeepsie in New York State to visit Dr. Richard Horowitz. There's no doubt in my mind this is probably one of the most intelligent bacteria on the planet. In fact, it has three times more DNA than any of its closest relatives, which would be chlamydia and ammonia. Um, this organism knows how to evade the immune system. It knows how to hide inside cells. Um, it has decoy mechanisms to protect itself from the immune system. It knows how to shift its outer surface proteins, so it fools the immune system in finding it. Uh, it's a very clever bacteria, so there definitely is an intelligence to this bacteria. It's been around for millions of years. They discovered it in amber specimens actually years ago, um, and in Otzi, who was the Neanderthal man, who was found in Tyrolia. So the bacteria's been around for a long time, but I don't think people have recognized the full clinical manifestations um, of causing fatigue and arthritis and memory problems, yet the bacteria's been around for quite a long time. Well, like any new disease, there are always two camps um, who debate the existence of a disease and how to diagnose and treat it. And in this case, the two camps are the Infectious Disease Society of America and ILADS, the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society, of which I was one of the founding members. So when Lyme was discovered approximately 40, 45 years ago in Lyme, Connecticut by Dr. Alan Steer, he's a rheumatologist and he did an excellent job discovering the bacteria. But he thought because people failed one or two weeks of antibiotics that it was an autoimmune disease. And then the infectious disease doctors got a hold of it and there was funding from the NIH uh, that they got on this. And they also felt that it was mainly autoimmune or they just didn't understand why people stayed chronically ill. So over time, the debate has developed where we now know, in fact, that the blood tests to diagnose this disease are very unreliable. Um, we miss approximately half the patients. It's like a coin flip using the standard test of an ELISA. Um, one of the tests in Europe that's also used in the U.S. called the C6 ELISA. It's a bit better because it also checks for European strains. So there are 100 strains of Lyme disease in the United States and 300 strains worldwide. And in Europe, Borrelia abzelii and Borrelia gerinii are two of the major forms of Borrelia that exist in Europe. And abzelii causes a skin rash called acrodermatitis, chronic amyotrophic hands. It's a violaceous skin rash of the hands and feet. And Borrelia gerinii causes neuroborreliosis or neurological problems with Lyme. This new test, the C6 ELISA, will pick up these other strains of Lyme. So a lot of the doctors, when they don't find it, they're using an outdated form of an ELISA. It is much better, in my opinion, to use the C6 ELISA and to also use a Western blot 
with a laboratory that looks at several different strains of Lyme. It, it's become a taboo subject because there's a political aspect to this disease. It's not just a medical disease. Uh, so for example, in the United States, doctors' licenses have been taken away for diagnosing and treating this. Medical boards have come after doctors. Uh, fortunately, in New York State, where I practice, the governor signed a bill about two years ago protecting doctors in New York State for diagnosing and treating it. There are other states that have followed. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, in Europe, for example, in France, I know doctors who've had their license taken away. Um, and many doctors are scared to treat this disease because European governments and uh, many other governments, Australia, they're using CDC guidelines. And the problem is, is that the CDC said on their website that Lyme disease is a clinical diagnosis. You're only supposed to use the test for making a clinical diagnosis, but the insurance companies took this definition and they told doctors this was the only way to diagnose it. So many doctors are thrown out of insurance companies for not following the insurance company guidelines. Um, there are conflicts of interest of some of the members of the Infectious Disease Society of America. Uh, some of them do make money from some of the Lyme tests. Um, and they've been getting funds from the NIH for quite a long period of time to hold their same viewpoint, which is that it's an autoimmune phenomenon, uh, there's damage to the body, or we just don't know why people are sick. Except in the middle of a number one worldwide spreading epidemic, it's just not acceptable to say we don't know why these people are staying ill. So in 2013, the CDC revised their estimates and they said that there was a tenfold increase in the number of Lyme cases from 30,000 to over 300,000 cases a year. However, we know that they are not counting uh, the people who have been diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, which is three and a half percent of the American population, fibromyalgia, which is 1.5 percent of the American population. So there alone, you're dealing with millions of people that may have Lyme disease because the way you make the diagnosis of chronic fatigue and fibro is someone who's tired, they have aches and pains, they have sleep disorders, they have memory problems, and their autonomic nervous system, the part of their nervous system that controls the blood pressure is thrown off. Well, you see that with chronic fatigue, with fibro, and with Lyme. So the numbers, I think, are grossly underestimated. I suspect there's probably at least one to two million people a year getting Lyme disease in the United States. Uh, the World Health Organization has shown that there's millions of people across especially uh, Western Europe that are getting Lyme disease um, in the Balkan countries. And we know in China that up to 6% of the Chinese population has had and been exposed to Lyme. And I know that because I met with the head of the CDC in China. Uh, the Chinese government invited me over as a consultant and told me privately that those were the numbers, which would mean 6% uh, of 1.4 billion people uh, you're dealing with 50, 60 million people. You're dealing with huge numbers of people who have Lyme disease. In 2015, the CDC then revised the estimates and said that there was a 320% increase in the number of counties affected in the United States, that it was spreading in all directions. So because the blood tests are unreliable, um, the ELISA will only pick up approximately half the people. And the fact that the insurance companies have adopted the ELISA followed by a Western blood which is what the CDC uses to epidemiologically screen large numbers of people, we find that the insurance companies are not really adequately diagnosing these people. Um, and therefore, instead of getting to the source of the illness, they're just allowing their doctors to give these people medication to treat their pain. Uh, they may take Aricept patches and Nemenda for their memory problems. They may take uh, anti-inflammatory medicines and Neurontin for their neuropathy and their pain but they're not getting to the underlying source. And I suspect that they think they may be saving money um, doing this because the insurance companies at this point are suffering in the United States. Um, our healthcare system is certainly in disarray at this point. Um, and I think that we do need a, an overhaul of the way we do practice chronic disease medicine. But I do think the insurance companies, um, they know there are two guidelines for treating Lyme and they have chosen the guideline that basically says that very few people get this disease and need to be treated. So um, I think that needs to be addressed um, from a political issue and hopefully the 21st Century Cure Act got passed in Congress just this past year. Hopefully we will have better answers for Lyme, uh, which the insurance companies will adapt in the next couple of years. Doctors need to be aware of this disease because it is going to affect the future generations of America. For example, Mothers can transmit Lyme disease as well as other tick-borne infections like Babesia, um, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Bartonella. These can all be transmitted to the fetus. And I know for a fact that OBGYNs generally are not screening women for Lyme disease and tick-borne disorders before they get pregnant. 
if they would use the questionnaire that's in my book as a simple screening tool, they would see that these women have a multi-systemic illness. They're tired, they're achy, they have a headache. The key to Lyme disease, however, is migratory pain, migratory joint pain, migratory muscle pain, migratory nerve pain. If OBGYNs were to ask these questions, they'd be able to see if a woman about to get pregnant has Lyme or a psychiatrist who has a patient come in and say, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, I have obsessive compulsive disorder, I'm schizophrenic. Lyme causes every neuropsychiatric manifestation that psychiatrists see. A psychiatrist would want to hand out this questionnaire to see if they have a multi-systemic disorder. So because Lyme will affect the heart, the cardiologists need to be looking into it, right? There, we had a young man in Poughkeepsie years ago who came back from Rhode Island and he had a flu-like illness. The doctor checked him for Lyme. The test was negative and he died three weeks later from Lyme carditis. There's definitely an urgency to diagnose this disease because if you can get it within the first 30 days, you can cure it. So we know that 75 to 80% of the people, if they happen to see the bullseye rash, and by the way, half of the rashes look like bullseyes, and half of the rashes are solid spreading rashes, but 50% of the people or more, at least in the United States, do not get the rash. But if you do find the rash or see a tick bite and get sick, and you treat it, for example, with doxycycline or ceftin in the first 30 days, you can cure it. However, those people who are not so lucky, who go past 30 days, those are usually the ones who come to my medical practice, who have long-term problems. They've been to 10 to 20 doctors looking for answers. And by the time they come to see me, many of them are disabled. So it's very important that people follow a sugar-free, uh, yeast-free diet, because when you're giving antibiotics, you can affect an overgrowth of yeast in the colon and also could cause diarrhea. So the first thing we do is we tell people to stay off all sugar. Uh, many of them do well off gluten. You have to check if they have food sensitivities. Because the thing about Lyme disease is the symptoms of Lyme disease are due to inflammation in the body. There are molecules called inflammatory cytokines, uh, TNF-alpha, IL-1, IL-6, interferon gamma. These are the molecules that cause people to be sick with Lyme. If you have food allergies, like if you're sensitive to gluten or if you're allergic to dairy or wheat, you're gonna get the same inflammatory molecules produced just like you do with Lyme. So in the 16-point MSIDS model that I use, eight out of the 16 points cause inflammation. So these people have to get to sleep. If you don't get to sleep at night, you have too much inflammation, too much interleukin-6 is produced. If you're eating the wrong foods, right? If you have the wrong bacteria in the microbiome of your gut, you could have inflammation. If you're mineral deficient, like zinc deficiency, will cause increased inflammation in the body. So we give high-dose probiotics, over 300 billion of good quality probiotics with Saccharomyces boulardii to stop C. diff diarrhea. Um, we have people on a regular exercise program, getting them to sleep. And then we use things like low-dose naltrexone. Low-dose naltrexone has been published in the medical literature for multiple sclerosis, for Crohn's disease, for fibromyalgia, and we've used it in over a thousand people with Lyme, and we find it to be very effective. In fact, my wife is still on LDN after getting over Lyme disease, and she finds it to be very, very useful. The reason LDN works, and the reason we use nutritional supplements with LDN, is LDN will block certain cells in the brain called microglial cells. These are these small glial cells in the brain that cause inflammation. And those are the cells that have been responsible for the manifestations of Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative disorders. They're the same cells that cause inflammation in patients with Lyme disease. So LDN will shut down this microglial proliferation of making cytokines, it helps to shift some of the cytokine formation in the body, so there's less tumor necrosis factor alpha, less interleukin-6, and the way it does this is there is a switch inside the nucleus of the cells called NF-kappa B. So if you can shut off this switch inside your cells called NF-kappa B, which LDN does, and other things that do it, for example, are nutritional supplements, like curcumin, green tea extract, broccoli seed extract, resveratrol, these are the four supplements that we use with LDN that tell this particular switch inside the nucleus to turn off, shuts down the production of these inflammatory molecules, and people feel tremendously better. So LDN and using these nutritional supplements to help decrease the inflammatory response is part of the regular protocol that we use for people who are chronically ill with Lyme disease. My journey took me back to Europe and the ancient city of Antwerp in Belgium to meet Paul de Sadelier a compounding pharmacist and a European chair of ILADS. Of course, the treatment of Lyme 
is, 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 is a complicated treatment because the approach should be an integrative approach. And this is basically, in my opinion, uh, the biggest challenge in Europe uh, when I compare the situation with the situation in America. I have the feeling that much more uh, medical doctors, GPs in America, are uh, using the integrative approach, functional medicine, much more than in, than in Europe. And especially in treatment of Lyme, it's a multi-systemic disease. You need the integrative approach because the pathogen is causing an immune dysfunction, but is also disrupting our detoxification, is uh, uh, damaging our mitochondria, is uh, impairing our uh, cognitive and, and memory uh, functions, is uh, often causing uh, gut uh, hyperpermeability. So you have the, the different, the, the multi-systemic aspects of this multi-infection and the only way, uh, especially in the chronic, the persistent cases, to be successful in your treatment is to have this integrative approach. So if we uh, educate doctors on Lyme treatments, it's not only an education on the level of uh, what kind of pathogens, bacteria, viruses are we dealing with, it's also on the level of what is functional integrative medicine. So, and this is, um, it's a big challenge. It's uh, uh, a big distance we have, we have, we have to cover, but let's, let's see it in a, in a positive way. If we compare the situation as it is now with, for example, five years ago, I see much more doctors who are motivated, who are involved, who uh, follow conferences, want to learn more, who interact. So we definitely move forward. But of course, on the other end, I see also more and more Lyme patients. So it's, uh, it's of course, it's, uh, it's very time sensitive. Uh, but with uh, educations, educational sessions, uh, the conferences we organize, more and more doctors should be able to treat patients and to cure Lyme patients, even if it's a big challenge. Often doctors ask me, what are the possibilities? Well, LDN is one of the possibilities. Basically, I think we have two other studied possibilities, transfer factors and glutathione. Transfer factors because they also uh, restore the communication between T cells, what leads to a, a better Th1 response and a more balanced Th1, Th2 response. And glutathione, also glutathione, very important in Lyme, uh, restoring uh, or improving detoxification, also a very powerful antioxidant because we, we create a lot of oxidative stress in Lyme. Uh, but on top of that, glutathione is also improving our natural killer cell activity. So I think in our integrative approach, in our total approach, the immune part is, is a very important part. I have the feeling that uh, in the early stages, when we were uh, searching for solutions for Lyme, we focused too hard on uh, the antibiotic, antibacterial or antipathogen we uh, needed to use. And based on experience, based on the results in our patients, we realized that we needed something more, especially for the immune part. And I think just for that reason, 
LDN is, is a molecule that every doctor should consider at some point in treatment. In many different parts of Europe, it's still not accepted, especially in Scandinavia. We see that doctors lose their license just by um, applying the guidelines and prescribing, for example, antibiotics. So it's really tough in, in, the, in some parts of, of Europe. But we need to find a, a global solution for that. And so based on the situation, how it is now in France, we would like to improve the, the total European uh, acceptance and uh, situation especially of the patients. So what about getting better from Lyme disease? I travelled to California to meet three doctors who all treat Lyme patients successfully. It's hard to say exactly how many people that I, that I have in my practice that I'm treating with Lyme, but uh, recently, I started using some different testing methods, and um, I would say probably in the last couple of months, I've picked up maybe 10 patients in my caseload that are actually testing positive for Lyme now. So I think that it might be skewed toward thinking it's more women because probably I have a lot more women in my practice. I think women um, certainly manifest a lot more immune symptomatology than, than men in general is kind of what we've seen historically, but I also think women are more likely to come in for treatment and more open to discussing some of these symptoms that other people think are crazy. It's incumbent upon us to support the immune system. So many people get Lyme and they're able to clear it. They get a slight infection, they might feel like they have the flu over the weekend and their immune system takes care of it and those aren't the people we have to worry about. But we have some people that have loading genetically. They might have a genetic HLA type, the HLA-DR, that makes them susceptible to developing chronic Lyme with an infection. They may have um, problems with their GI system, their diet, their gut might not be working well. And of course, most of our immune system is in our gut. 60% is in the gut. So if people have GI problems, their immune system already is going to be compromised. And so. People with various other factors happening are the ones that will get into trouble with chronic Lyme. Um, so the first thing that I do is work with their diet. I mean, if people are not eating well, um, if you know, food has the power to, to you know, turn on good genes and turn on bad genes. And so if people aren't eating well, there's no way that we can support their immune system to get better. So that's the first place that we start. What are you eating? Um, and work with the diet and then work with the health of the gut. So I do testing um, in all my patients at the first visit. I do comprehensive stool analysis testing and I look for bacterial overgrowth, yeast overgrowth, parasites, what are their inflammatory markers, how are they digesting their food, you know, what are their basic probiotic levels there. And, um, and so to me that's kind of the first level. Um, I also look at nutrient levels. There's various nutrients, magnesium, zinc, um, some of the B vitamins that all affect how the immune system works. So trying to bring all those things into balance are going to be my first way that I work with treating people with any kind of infection. Well, it's pretty amazing with the diet. Some people can come in to me with, say, a severe depression, and I can take out the inflammatory foods, take out the gluten, take out the dairy, get them on a whole foods diet, just work with some basic nutrients. And I can have people that are crying all day long and suicidal that will, in short order, just be completely normal. <laughs> it's really um, important in my mind to take out in foods that are inflammatory. So um, anything that's inflaming the gut is going to compromise the immune system. Um, so for me, it's very important to ask people to take out gluten. We have plenty of data that that's a very inflammatory food. We, uh, it's been modified, um, it's, it's not been genetically modified, but it's been hybridized so that it contains more and more gluten and we just don't seem to digest that anymore. 
And so it doesn't matter to me if people are allergic or not, it's just going to compromise their gut function. And if I want to heal their immune system, I need to start by healing their gut. Um, so that's kind of my line in the sand. I ask all patients to stop the gluten. Um, some patients I ask them to stop all grains, especially those with neurodegenerative symptoms. Um, the grains have been implicated in, um, in affecting the brain in many ways. Um, another important factor with the grains is the sugar content. So they're very high in sugar. The glycemic index is 20% higher than table sugar with wheat. And so one important part of settling down someone's immune system, there's so many factors. You have to look at all the factors um, that are out of balance. And for a lot of people, it's their blood sugar regulation. So many people have prediabetes that I'm seeing. And so eliminating the grains helps to regulate the blood sugar. Um, the, the dairy for some people is um, inflammatory. It's the second most common food allergy that we have. We know it elevates insulin growth factor one, um, which is implicated in cancers and other inflammatory disorders. Um, so especially for people that have problems with um, sinus allergies, it give me a history of early ear infections and throat infections. Those are people I like to stop the dairy with as well. I do believe that in, in large degree we're in the midst of an epidemic that, you know, there, uh, we know that, you know, in the, in the U.S. alone there's probably at least 300,000 uh, new cases every year of Lyme disease and those are CDC numbers which were um, upgraded from a, a previous estimate of around 30,000 and they, you know, uh, so the, the number of, of 300,000 is, you know, still thought to be possibly conservative, you know, so there might be, you know, a, a much larger number of new cases every year. Um, and, you know, some of those cases, I would say actually, you know, pr probably more than half of those people, if, if, you, if you get Lyme disease and you're treated with the normal recommended course of uh, two to three weeks of antibiotics, um, you know, most of those people go on to be fine and, and not have long-term symptoms. Um, but we're getting better and better understanding and better data to point to the fact that there is a significant subset of people who do go on to have chronic symptoms. You know, I feel like in the last three to four years that we're kind of over the tipping point of, of you know, whether or not uh, this thing is real, <laughs> if you will. Um, and you know, we're still not seeing, unfortunately, we're still not seeing the funding that we need um, on the, the ad administrative or government sides, et cetera. You know, when you have these patients that are, um, have, have cases that, again, don't seem to fit into any one box um, and uh, uh, span multiple different body systems, symptoms coming and going. So, again, the index of suspicion when they arrive is, is higher. And that's important because, um, again, I think it's actually fairly common to be exposed to some of these pathogens. And so some of the problems with the potential testing is that you could have somebody who's relatively symptom-free who might show some markers positive on the testing. So you really have to put the testing together with the clinical picture. Um, so there was actually a good study that came out of the UK, a meta-analysis um, this past year, that showed that the sensitivity of, of Lyme disease testing is hovering a little bit above 50%, so almost as good as a flip of a coin, basically. Um, and so the chances, you know, sensitivity basically, the chances that if the test says you don't have the disease, the chances that that test is wrong is, is around 50%. So the tests miss a lot of people. And so again, it's very important at that point to combine the whole story, um, understand you know, what, the, what the potential risk is. is this, has this person had documented tick bites? Have they been in, in uh, Lyme endemic areas, which unfortunately is many parts of the world, so that's not hard to achieve. Um, there's also some testing in Europe that we've been looking, using in Germany, um, looking for uh, T cell activation. You know, and again, the, the traditional Western blot, ELISA to Western blot, CDC two-tier testing. Um, again, the bacteria is so smart and can evade that frequently those antibodies aren't there when they should be. I always tell people that you know this when we look at the at, at these tests and and we look at you know what you're reporting to me about your health, you know this could be construed as scary or overwhelming or, um, I, wow, I had no idea there was so much wrong with me, et cetera. When I see all that data, I get excited, you know, because here's somebody who has been suffering for years and years 
with no answers, and now we have a map, and we have a roadmap of, of you know, things to try, things to work on. Yeah, so uh, first phase uh, of treatment for me is always uh, trying to optimize the patient's immune system, and usually that focuses on their gastrointestinal system. So you know, we, we do comprehensive stool testing with a couple of different labs simultaneously. We always uh, frequently do, almost always do SIBO breath testing for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And, uh, and at that point, almost always my first intervention is, is a, a supportive and also antimicrobial protocol for the gut, for the gastrointestinal system. And along with that, I will address um, certain key you know, nutrient deficiencies, um, hormone imbalances, whether thyroid or adrenal. I see those as uh, uh, you know, adrenal dysregulation, thyroid imbalance. Um, as, as very core pieces. These, these are all like the, the legs of the stool, if you will, that you know, if we can get that stool solid and get the person balanced on these core levels, everything else that we're gonna try to do um, is going to be more effective. You know, we're gonna quiet down immune system hyperactivity, quiet down inflammation, get their detoxification systems uh, working better. Um, you know, and almost always the person feels better from these protocols without ever directly addressing, you know, what we might think might be some hidden infections lurking in the background. And my take on that is that, you know, we know from this really exciting field on, you know, uh, microbiome, microbiota, uh, gastrointestinal ecosystem um, in, in all of our body, this, this um, you know, bacterial uh, microbiota balance that we carry. Uh, we know that um, you can make uh, pretty impressive gains on, on the immune function, on the ability to, c to control inflammation, and to um, quiet down um, autoimmune activation. So those are, are really key pieces. And, w and with that, um, you know, dietary intervention is, is our foundation as well. Uh, using low-dose naltrexone um, is, is definitely a growing part of my practice. And um, I think at this point, Definitely, the majority of my patients are either on it or we've tried it, and um, for some reason, you know, a small percentage of people decide that that's not not something they want to be taking. But um, and it's also I'm noticing that I'm I'm using it earlier and earlier in the in the treatment. You, it, you know, previously it was something like I would see the patient, I would I would talk to them about some options, I would send them out with a bunch of testing, they would come back in a couple of months, we'd go over the results, um, and particularly with the SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. I was, had been using a lot of low-dose naltrexone because of its, uh, um, you know, activity as a pro-motility agent um, to help, you know, with gastrointestinal motility. A and these patients who come in are, are kind of like this, um, almost this like soup of inflammatory mediators. You know, they're 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 really overloaded with triggers and they're not able to, um, you know, clear out the the toxins, etc. Um, and so the, the, any interventions that we can do that help to start lowering that inflammatory load, I find beneficial across you know, almost no matter what is happening for them. You know, so I think that, that, that the, the low-dose naltrexone, in terms of its ability to, to, to modulate that inflammation, to kind of reset that autoimmune activation, um, is really, really helpful. Yeah, there's absolutely a denial um, and, and a, a controversy as well as a rise in the public media of, of, in terms of awareness around, around Lyme disease. And to be very honest with you, it really confuses me. I don't understand it. Uh, I don't understand, you know, you know, it, you know I, I went through my medical training through my medical school and my residency and, you know, m almost minimal exposure was uh, given to these infections other than the very mainstream, you know, sort of you have Lyme disease, you get your bullseye rash and your knee swells up and you take your two weeks of antibiotics and you're fine. And, you know, so it really was, a, uh, and many of us, it happens this way where it becomes a personal issue, either a friend or a family member or, or sometimes a, a practitioner themselves um, forces them to kind of dig in deeper. Um. So since my specialty is um, treating immune, uh, immune brain and gut issues, I treat a lot of people with autoimmune diseases, neurodegenerative disorders. I treat autis autistic spectrum disorders, 
chronic infections of all types, including chronic Lyme's. I do treat a lot of patients with Lyme disease. I use the same protocols that I use to treat my patients with autoimmune disease. It, autoimmune disease is an epigenetic disease with triggers. Lyme disease has very similar profiles, uh, very similar triggers, very similar things that make it worse and better, and very similar responses to patients with autoimmune disease. And so I find a very good success rate in treating patients in a similar manner. Researchers have said that dietary factors that change the microbiome might be a cause or contributing factor to up to 90% of human diseases. I see that dietary changes help people almost universally. So dietary changes are a very powerful aspect. Every patient that I see sees a nutritionist. That's one of the important cornerstones of treatment, whether it's chronic Lyme or any other chronic disease process. Research has also shown that changing your diet changes your microbiome within about four days. Your microbiome is all the bacteria and microorganisms that live in and on your human body, but mainly we're talking about, when we mention the microbiome, we're mainly talking about the bacteria and microbi microbiota that are inside your gastrointestinal tract. As that microbiome changes with diet, it literally changes your human genetic expression for either disease or health. Oftentimes, poor diet means not just that you're not getting the nutrients that you need, but that you're feeding your body hormones, chemicals, things that aren't really food. Human bodies are designed, made, grown to digest food. Our body knows how to do that. I can tell you that people of all types that have a poor diet, that they do have, and especially when they're not willing to fix it themselves, that they do have poor outcomes. And when I have patients that either can't or won't change their diet, they are not the patients that I have that heal. So one of the first things that I say in regards to diet is eat food that's just food. No additives, preservatives, chemicals, hormones, genetically modified organisms. If you are eating a food, if it comes in a package, you should be able to understand every ingredient that's on that package. It should be something that you can buy at your store and add to your food at home. So, for instance, high fructose corn syrup is something that we've heard is a natural ingredient, but it's not something that you can buy at the store and add to your food. So it shouldn't be in your foods. And then adding in, there should always be more vegetables than proteins on your plate for any given meal. And lots of times that's something that we're getting backwards in the United States and I think in most industrialized nations. And then um, breads and pastas, these nearly non-foods are things that take up a third or a half of our plate very often. And these are things that don't contain very much, um, very many sources of nutrients, but they do have very detri detrimental effects, effects, both on the microbiome and on the enterocytes, which are the cells of the wall of the gut. Lyme disease is something that has become almost as scary as cancer to some people because it seems like there's no hope of recovery and there are people who stay sick for years and even decades. With the right treatment, I believe that everyone with Lyme can be treated. I typically tell my patients with Lyme to expect a six month to two year recovery period depending on all the aspects that are going on with their health, everything that we have to treat, how they respond, and how compliant they are with their treatment regimen. In um, what's happening around chronic disease states like autoimmune disease, neurodegenerative disorders, chronic infections like Lyme, I really feel that our medical system either oversimplifies or overcomplicates things. Lyme disease is unique in that it, it does kind of hide from our immune system, but it does that through several chemical mechanisms that are being better and better defined. One of the things that Lyme does that's 
fairly atypical as far as we know is that it's a pleomorphic organism. That means it changes shapes. So it's, it's a shape shifter inside of our system. As it changes shapes, the antibiotics, for instance, only treat one of the three forms that Lyme takes. Whilst in California, one name kept cropping up. Dr. Kent Holthoff. He agreed to meet me at his office in Los Angeles. His forthright views hold so much substance and as a keen practitioner and user of LDN, it was important we hear from him. The whole world is suffering from this immune dysfunction and it's the basis of so many illnesses. Why this worked for so many illnesses? And, um, and so with you know, all, everything from chronic stress, gluten, you know, for, uh, GMOs, uh, autoimmune diseases, chronic infections, uh, gut issues, all these things are causing the immune system to be dysfunctional. And so you have two sides to your immune system. You have Th1 and Th2 in general. So Th1 gets stuff inside the cell, Th2 gets stuff outside the cell. So they need to be balanced. What happens in so many different illnesses, even with just aging, your Th1 goes down, your Th2 goes up. So now you can't fight these intracellular infections. You get reactivating virus such as you know, the herpes virus, shingles, the chicken pox comes out, um, and you, you can't fight those infections, but you have too much inflammation going on. So increased heart disease, autoimmune disease, and then when you get the autoimmune disease or allergy, that makes it worse. So it's com continually driving the body in this direction and causes so many things, and which is why we see with, for instance, Lyme disease, Almost everyone, if not everyone, has autoimmunity. They have, uh, we're finding now antibodies to the brain, which they're calling, you know, basically it's a version of PANDAS, which is normally childhood illness, uh, where the, the strep infection, the body cross-reacts and attacks the brain. That's going on in the majority of Lyme patients that we are testing. And so uh, one, the key to, for uh, treating Lyme disease, the key is treating the immune system. If you fix the immune system, you get rid of the Lyme disease. Most people who have Lyme disease have no symptoms. That's the problem. And when you look at a lot of these tests and they come out, the, the uh, FDA will say, oh, that's an inaccurate test because people who have no symptoms uh, turned up positive. But guess what? Five years, 10 years later, when they have a significant stress, family, uh, basically death in the family, a divorce, emotional trauma seems to really be able to trigger it but also, let's say, a car accident or another infection or a cancer, all of a sudden, boom, it just it hits. And now the body can't suppress that Lyme. It comes out, suppresses the immune system more, all these other infections. So which is why Lyme patients, they have usually, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 other diagnoses, which aren't necessarily incorrect, but it's what's, what's causing it. And it becomes a chicken or the egg saying what causes. So you have to treat all those different components so now the body can actually fight the infection. And, and that question comes up, and it's a very good question. What is Lyme disease? And people say, well, it's an infection by you know, the Borrelia burgdorferi, um, but it's, it's a lot more than that. And we're finding the problem is, is that is, it usually is asymptomatic. There's, a couple, there's so many different forms of it that some people that get Lyme, when we call Lyme disease, it's typically thought of when people get acute Lyme. They get bitten by a tick. They, you know, a week or so later, they get flu-like feelings and a rash, and they have the typical syndrome treated with antibiotics that goes away. But that's a fraction of the people that have chronic Lyme disease. Chronic Lyme disease is very different. It basically, you know, usually don't know when you got it. Majority of people have no idea. They've never been uh, really high risk for a tick infection, um, for, for a tick bite, and they go along no problem. All of a sudden, middle age, they start getting stressed, that immune system starts shifting, then all of a sudden they get hit. They're like, oh my gosh, what's going on? I've been diagnosed with fibromyalgia, I've been diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome. So it affects almost every cell in the body. Um, and it's very slow growing, very resistant, and which is why there's all these controversies. And, and they'll say, uh, for instance, well, if it's Lyme disease, you treat it for three weeks of antibiotics, oh, they're not better, then it can't be Lyme disease. And we had the same thing with chronic fatigue syndrome, where we would have patients come in, we, we published our studies, uh, we had 500 patients come in, uh, they had seen on average 7.2 physicians without any improvement before seeing us, 
Uh, after five visits, they basically had dramatic, you know, some dramatic, significant, and uh, in, in any improvement in, um, in, in their overall sense of well-being was hugely significant. And their energy level doubled and all this. And we, we, so patients would say they'd show it to their doctor and they'd say, well, you obviously didn't have chronic fatigue syndrome because it's incurable. I, it, it's, it's very good to be uh, skeptical. And that's what we want. We want healthy medical debate. But unfortunately, that hardly ever happens anymore. It's be become so polarized, so political. Are you with us or against us? And you know, uh, well, I'm not married to any treatment or any diagnosis. If uh, you know, basically, a patient comes in, all the symptoms fit Lyme disease. Okay, do you either diagnose them with 42 different diagnoses, or does this make sense? They turn out positive on tests. You give them treatments, they get better. I believe it's Lyme disease. If a patient goes to a doctor and the doctor can't get her better, he feels terrible. But how can he feel better about him or herself and say, I don't believe that person's helpful. I don't believe it's a real illness. So either now, and if they believe Lyme, now they're going to have to go back and spend how, tons of hours trying to learn about how to treat Lyme and treat this patient. And they don't have time. They don't get paid extra for doing that. They just, you know, they basically pay colds and flus, but you have one complicated Lyme patient that involves the entire system of the body. That's the problem. Who's supposed to take care of this person? And you're just clogging up their, their time. So it's so much easier for them and serves them well emotionally, financially, to say this doesn't exist. It takes on average 17 years for a proven concept to be accepted in mainstream medicine. They found, well, again, why is that? And one, doctors don't read medical journals. They don't. They don't have time. There's no incentive to do it. Why should they find out some new treatment? Everything's dictated by the insurance companies. So you basically, doctor goes in, how does the doctor make the most money? You see as many patients as he can, make the quickest diagnosis, and get that medication to that patient and get them out. Some of this controversy in line, Lyme driven from a financial standpoint by insurance companies saying, hey, we're not going to pay for this. Absolutely. Lyme is a horrible illness and it's horribly expensive because especially they had it for a long time, it takes a long time to get better on most cases. And, and then what they look at, you know, again, you're going to believe the data that supports what benefits you. So the insurance companies look at the data that said three months of antibiotics wasn't, didn't make the patient significantly better, although there are some that show it, some that, that it didn't work. You know, my response well, wasn't long enough and we can do a lot of other things that do help the patient, but they use those to say, okay, we, we can deny treatment. And, and, and you hear, yes, that Lyme disease, you know, mimics other illnesses. Syphilis was known as the great imitator. It imitates other illnesses. And whether that is a, a smart, thing, you know, that, oh, it's, it's going to try to show you it's something else. I think it's more, it really fits with the pathophysiology of the illness. And that so many illnesses are driven from the same underlying problem, which is the abnormal immune system. And we're finding, I mean, now it seems like everybody's sick and the, the rate of chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, asthma, diabetes, all these things are immune dysfunction. That is at the base. Again, that TH1, TH2 is like this. People get more cancers, more diabetes, inability to lose weight. These infections are driving that, so you're getting all those same, but basically, symptoms. And I, I even we're finding, you know, what's a, a symptom of Lyme for us? One is type 2 diabetes. Uh, usually it's Babesia, so a co-infection of Lyme. So it's this chronic inflammation that causes so many things, and it begin, it becomes a chicken or the egg. The inflammation suppresses the pituitary, which then causes low hormones, so now you get hypothyroidism, which now there's no energy, there's no energy for the immune system, that goes down, body can't fight the infection, it gets worse and worse. And that's why we look at it as such a multi-system illness. So you have people, a lot of people have uh, basically a, a gene that clots very quickly. At some point in our ancestry, that was good. You could, whenever you get cut or bitten by something, you clot it quickly, you're gonna survive. Now it's a negative, we're living longer, uh, basically, you, uh, people have more strokes and heart attacks, and we're finding with Lyme, you get this, a number of different things, is you get immune activation of coagulation, so the body lays down fibrin uh, along the vessel, not a clot, but fibrin, and what happens, oxygen now cannot get into the cells very, very easily, which normally takes two seconds to get, and it takes up to two minutes. So the cells are starving for oxygen, 
And we do a, a little test for that, and people will they'll complain of air hunger, is that if people, you um, t uh, take a breath, hold out, blow out all your air, and then you check a pulse ox. Now a normal person, as the, as the oxygen goes in the lungs, in, and then uh, into the uh, capillaries, then into the cell, now that, that oxygen level will drop because there's nothing replacing it. With Lyme patients, majority of them, you see that doesn't drop. So it's not going anywhere, it's just staying in the blood. And we're also finding that so many uh, Lyme patients have autoimmune things like antiphospholipid syndrome. And then so you start getting this overlap of autoimmunity, hypercoagulability, and things causing this whole array of symptoms. So it's why so, there's so many different presentations of Lyme. But I'm just noticing it seems that every person I talk to, either them or a family member has got some serious illness that the first thing I think of is Lyme. You know, they got chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, they can't get out of bed, they have MS, and it's just exploding. And, and people, they'll say it themselves that why is everyone sick now? Even the obesity, and there's good evidence that obesity is infectious. So I think all these things are a problem. And the government, you know, it's when do you basically, you know, pull the cord and say, oh my gosh, we have an emergency here. And the question, you know, why don't some patients respond to antibiotics? I think it's, it's certainly multifactorial. And the key determinant is the immune system. So if you have an intact immune system or good Th1, Th2 isn't elevated yet, and you get Lyme, you know, you can treat that. If you get antibiotics on board fast enough, good chance you're going get, to get rid of that infection. Yeah, and, and so the you know, question comes, how do you treat a Lyme patient, and, and that's one thing you can look at the patient's immune system, you can tell if it's acute, chronic. You know, we do a large panel of tests, which are becoming more and more difficult to get because insurance companies, but we can pretty much pick out a Lyme, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia patient 80% or so of the time and, and likely how uh, severe their symptoms are. So we, we, we can actually tell those things from a blood test without talking to the patient. So when people say they don't believe in these things, say, well, we can, you know, put, put it with just their labs, we can pick them out. Hey, they're not making it up. So, so really, again, uh, how do you treat chronic Lyme? You know, antibiotics certainly may be a part, but we found once you reach that threshold on their own, they're likely not going to be successful. You have to do other treatments. If you don't fix the immune system, the patient doesn't get better. So an LDN uh, basically does what we want it to do is we'll shift that TH1, TH2. It will lower inflammation, but increase that good immunity. So your body can now have a chance to fight those intracellular infections. Yeah, and, and there's so many therapies for, for Lyme patients that work. And there's so many therapies that don't. And, but you know, the sun, oftentimes they're the same treatments. One patient says, oh my gosh, this was amazing. Other person says, that didn't do anything for me. And it depends on the person, the strain, the co-infections, where in the stage of treatment they are. We'll find patients tried something early on, it didn't do anything for them, but after you make progress, that same treatment is profoundly effective for them. It's yeah, in, in terms of the financial issues with Lyme and every other illness, and you look at the model is now, you know, it's basically currently you don't need a medication until you're sick enough. And, and you know, and basically so 90% of the healthcare dollars are spent in the, in the last five years of a person's life. And that's where all the money is, you know. No one wants to spend it earlier, which would be much more cost effective. But insurance companies don't want to do that. They say, well, they'll save money in the long run because, but you'll probably be with a different insurance company, so they spent the money to save it for someone else. But it is a problem, this is, not an illness for the poor. It is very difficult to get treatments. Uh, you know, the, the best treatments are, are expensive, no, no doubt. And it is in a knowledgeable patient. And it's interesting where I encourage patients, go on the internet, look up all the information you can, come back and we'll talk about it. You know, and but so many doctors, if a patient does that and walks in with articles that I've been reading on Google, they stop reading on Google, you don't trust me, you know, is if you find a doctor like, like that, run. And unfortunately, most patients with Lyme know more about Lyme than their doctor does. I think Lyme is a scourge of humanity. It is going to become 
one of the worst problems of health for the entire world at some point unless something dramatic happens. The key is the immune system. That is the one thing that's going to make or break the success or failure of your treatment. LDN is one of a number of treatments, but it is a great starting point because it is cheap, extremely safe and, and effective. Does it work for everyone? No, nothing does. But treating the immune system is the key to successfully treating Lyme. To further understand the testing procedure, we paid a visit to Dr. Armin Schwarzbach in Augsburg, just outside Munich in Germany. Armilaps is highly specialized in tick-borne diseases, testings, and also advice uh, when the results have finished. Uh, tick-borne diseases are very common in the world. We know that uh, ticks are full of pathogens of different bacteria. And my laboratory can test blood samples from infected patients for different bacteria. We name them Borrelia burgdorferi, it's the main bacteria in the ticks, and then we have also other co so-called co-infections. Co-infections are Bartonella, Ehrlichia, Anablasma, Babesia, uh, Rickettsia. And my laboratory is doing testings from blood samples from all patients all over the world. So we find out if there are immune answers against different bacteria or not in the blood of patients. We have different uh, strains against Borrelia burgdorferi. We know actually it's over eight different strains which can make patients sick. The three very common strains in the world, in Europe especially, are uh, Borrelia burgdorferi sensu stricto and Borrelia burgdorferi garinii and Borrelia burgdorferi afcelii. In USA, it's a little different. Uh, we have more Borrelia burgdorferi sensu stricto, uh, but all over the world we can find a lot of other different subspecies, we name that, and one of the most common subspecies is Borrelia burgdorferi garinii, which makes some neurological problems and symptoms. We know that Borrelia burgdorferi is in up to 50% of infected ticks, so patients or people got bitten by the tick and the tick, if it, the tick is uh, full of this bacteria, then it can be transmitted into the body of people and then the question is how strong is your immune system, how strong is your natural immune defense against this, we name it pathogen, pathogen Borrelia burgdorferi and if your immune system is strong enough you can defeat it on a natural way, if not you can get symptoms. Symptoms for Lyme disease are at the beginning a bull's eye rash, bull's eye rashes are also named erythema migrans and um, but it's not in all of the patients, we have just 50% of the patients, of the people who got infected, uh, they really got this bull's eye rash or erythema migrans. So 50% you cannot diagnose because they don't have this bull's eye rash. And uh, also 20% can get summer flu after tick bite. So it's very important to, get summer, uh, to ask a patient, uh, patient did you get some summer flu after tick bite because this is a sign for a current infection with Lyme disease in this case. We name it stage one of the infection. If Borrelia is coming into your body by a tick bite, in a second step it can move around all over your body and can infect each organ system in your body. For example, it can inflame your brain, it can inflame your joints, your muscles, also it can inflame uh, your kidney, your liver, your eyes, it can move everywhere in your body. And this means a local inflammation by a bacteria in your body which makes symptoms. The question is which symptoms do you have after tick bite? A lot of patients I've seen, I think uh, meanwhile uh, several hundreds personally I have seen in my office and um, I found that a lot of patients they developed 
chronic fatigue syndrome immediately. They got very tired after tick bite. Uh, they call it also burnout syndrome. Doc, they say, doctor, I have a burnout syndrome. All the patients, they develop neck pain and headache. And especially where the tick bite was on the site, on this site where the tick bite was, the patients develop one of the first symptoms, neck pain, headache. And uh, the next can be also migraine joint pain. It can be also um, another different uh, symptom like uh, arthritis. It can be a different symptom like uh, neurological symptoms, sensitivity problems, burning hand, burning feet, loss of sensitivity, concentration problems, brain fog. So Borrelia can do every symptom in your body you can imagine. The best way uh, to get no tick bite means prevention so, and preparation. The better you are prepared, if you have, uh, for example, uh, your clothes are very important, um, that uh, there is no place where the tick bite can happen with you, for example. Um, also, if you walk in the middle of the tr uh, trails, very important, not to lean on trees, not uh, to walk um, outside the safe situation, not to sit in the grass. So the exposure is very important and the consciousness. Um, the tick bite doesn't happen immediately. You have also the chance after coming back from outside, from outdoor activities, to inspect yourself. You can inspect your hair, your ears, everywhere. You go under a shower, you, you, you look everywhere. You look at your back. Uh, also for children, very important to look everywhere where a tick bite can be, because prevention means everything. The tick is not biting immediately. You, The tick needs time to bite. It's not done in two seconds. So you have time, no panicking but prevention, prevention, prevention. The probability to get an infection with Borrelia burgdorferi, um, it's not such a high risk, but the risk is there. And uh, if you estimate uh, 10 tick bites, for example, you get one-time transmission statistically of Borrelia burgdorferi, but that doesn't mean that you get sick by the infection. Nevertheless, we have numbers from your USA, and in America we have around 400,000 new infections each year. And in USA, the CDC, they said some years ago, oh, we have just 30,000. That means we have more than tenfold higher infected people in USA. What does that mean? If you look at one year and uh, you do a, 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 a look at in 10 years, you have in 10 years, you have tenfold, 400,000, you have maybe 4 million infected patients. And that's a huge number. We have more and more problems with tick bites. Why? Because the outdoor behavior is different of the people. Um, we are forced to go outside to do some sports activities because we are sitting the whole year in our offices. So we need more movements outside, and, but the risk is outside and also very important, uh, the climax uh, is changing somehow. We have more and more ticks all over the world. The earth is heating up, so the ticks uh, get active when it's four up to five centigrades and also we have Lyme disease ca uh, cases in Greenland or in Alaska or in northern Norway. So we have more and more ticks everywhere around the world. But also the testing is better now. We find more infected people by better testings, uh, which uh, didn't exist 20 years ago. We have better testings for it. We find more infected people and the consciousness is better now. Just time.